Good morning. Don't get distracted. I hope you're all doing okay this morning. Uh, what a beautiful way to worship God and uh, serve Him and praise Him. We're talking about David and his prayer this morning. And as we were singing and worshiping, and you, I don't know if you noticed, I heard the drums a time or two. Uh, reminded me of how David would uh, celebrate and worship uh, with loud noise and drums. And you can read all of that uh, in the story of David in the book of Psalms. And so if you're actually talking about him and you want to learn from him this morning, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, uh, you can turn to Psalms chapter 3. Here, uh, King David introduces this chapter and he shares with us what's going on in his life before we go into the verses. And he says, a, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom. Now, I hope you know the story, but if you don't, you can always read a story in 2 Samuel chapter 15 through chapter 18. I'm not going to go there, but that is where the story is found. But let me just give you a very short overview. David is facing a very painful and embarrassing encounter. He has a son, Absalom, that he loves dearly. But his son rather would like to destroy his dad and uh, own and take away his position and possession. And he would rather take that than the love of his father. And so his son had been campaigning for a couple of years, but this was a secret campaign where his dad, the king, would not know or find out about it. And so he was campaigning and convincing people and grouping up people for, to favor him so that he could overthrow the throne of his father. And that was his purpose to do. And now just an hour or so before this is supposed to happen, David finds out about it and he makes it out of the city of Jerusalem. And here he is on a run from men who are trying to kill him, ordered by his own son. And then David writes this psalm. It's a song of grief, of sorrow, and misery. His life is shattered. His heart is broken. His family is divided. His future is in question. He has a serious people problem. Have you ever had a people problem? I didn't think so. It's just me, right? Yeah, we all have people problems sometimes. You can't avoid them. In life, there are going to be some people problems. So what does David do? He runs into the presence of God with his problems. He gives us a clear picture of what victorious faith looks like when we are tested with the most disastrous or challenging, unexpected things in life. So David had some serious people problem going on. And so we can learn through what he did how to bring our problems to the Lord. So first he, he shows us how to pray for our people problem. And so what we see and what he teaches us is the very first thing when you have people problems... Bring them to the Lord. Look at verse 1 and 2, Psalms 3. I want to read some other scriptures, but if you want to keep your Bibles open there, that would be very convenient for you. It says, O Lord, I have so many enemies, so many are against me, so many are saying, God will never rescue him. This would be like if you would uh, be somewhere in the wilderness, in an open field, and all of a sudden... You are surrounded by 500 wolves all the way around you. And, and there is nowhere out. I think that's the feeling that David had here. And, and the people that surrounded him said that <laughs> he's caught. There is no way ever God can rescue him from this. Right? 
That, that, that's the, the impression that he gives us that the people, his enemies, are saying. Now, he starts by bringing his complaint to the Lord. Some of you may say, well, doesn't the Bible teach you are not to complain about anything? Well, yes and no, the Bible teaches that, and it doesn't teach us that. We are to bring our complaints to him, not to around us. We are to lift up our complaints and struggles up. Don't leave them all around us. It, 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 it belongs to the Lord. And so we are to bring our complaints to God, not spread them out around us. And, and in fact, look what David says in Psalms 142, 1 and 2. He says, I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all my troubles. Now when pressure and complications and difficulties come our way in life, we are to bring them first to the one that has the capacity to understand us, who has the ability to care for us, and who has the power to effectively, perfectly act on our behalf. And that's also what Peter says, the same thing in 1 Peter 5, 7. He says, Care all, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. So we are to bring all our uh, complaints and issues to him. All the problems, all the difficulties, all the depressions, the hurts, they all belong to him. We are to bring them to him. And so the psalmist teaches us here how to deal effectively with our feelings and emotions when we are having problems. Now, let me first share a few things with you how we often deal with our emotions and problems that we may should not do that way so that we can learn not to do them. And now let me show what David teaches us how we should deal with them so we have a way to apply them. You know, so many times the way we deal with our emotions and feelings is we, we stuff them in internally. We, we stuff them in, we deny them, and we act like they're not even there. And when you swallow your feelings, your stomach keeps the score. It's not good for you or on you. It, it's like something inside of you that starts to boil and it starts to pressure up when you stuff them internally. And so if you are bottling your emotions and feelings up inside, the longer you keep them there, the worse they become and the more poisonous they are when they come out. But they are going to come out. One way or another, or sooner or later, there's going to be enough pressure, and it is going to come out. So, emotionally, we need to express them the way D David teaches us, because if we hold them inside, we will get all depressed, and we will struggle spiritually, and it will be a, a, an interruption in our lives. So let's not deny how we feel. Because if you deny how you feel, you won't heal. So we, in order to heal, we shouldn't deny it. Another way that we deal with how we feel is when our, our uh, emotions and feelings, uh, how we deal with them, so many times we vent them wrongly. You know, I, I went to the convenience store yesterday, and I bought me a Pepsi. I paid over $2 for this thing. I thought it was pretty pricey. Uh, but I bought me a Pepsi because I thought about buying a Dr. Pepper or a Coke, but I knew I had friends that like, also like Pepsi, and they might get upset with me if I would buy something different than they know me as a, my favorite drink as a Pepsi. Now, so I have bought me a Pepsi, and I know you were kind of curious about this, but I have a question. What would be a very bad idea for me to do right now? Open it, right? Open the mouth of the bottle. 
would be a bad idea. Why? Because if I open this, it will leave me in a mess. I'm going to cause damage around me. And some of these guys will, would even get some of that Pepsi on them and they would have sticky clothes on. And it would also leave you with a memory that you would not soon forget. Right? You know what? The same is true when you hurt. You are all shaken up in life. You have so many emotions and feelings and you just let that pressure build up inside of you. And then unwisely, you open your mouth. And things will come out of your mouth. I would call it trash and junk. And you will leave a big mass of you. You will cause a lot of damage around you. A lot of more hurt to others. And you will leave people with a memory that they will not soon forget. It's the same way. So let's not vent them wrongly. Now, what are we supposed to do? What does David teach us? How we should deal with our emotions and feelings and people problems. Don't stuff them internally. Don't vent them wrongly. Pray them honestly. Pray them honestly. When David was broken and wronged and hurt and betrayed, he didn't stuff it in. He didn't vent them out wrongly. He prayed about them. He prayed his feelings and his emotions. He said, God, I'm about to explode. God, I am filled with fear and anxiety. God, I, I feel like I'm about to die. We have a lot of examples in the book of Psalms that tells us how to deal with our feelings and emotions. I'm going to read a few of you to you, but there's many more. Let me read a few to you. Psalms chapter 6, verse 6 and 7, David says, I am wore out from sobbing. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with my tears. My vision is blurred by grief. My eyes are wore out because all of my enemies. Psalm 7, verse 1 and 2 says, I come to you for protection, O Lord my God. Save me from my uh, persecutors. Rescue me. If you don't, I will be mole, they will mold me like a lion, tear me to pieces with no one to rescue me. Psalms 143, 7 says, Come quickly, O Lord, and answer me, for my depression deepens. Don't turn away from me, or I will die. The Psalms are filled and soaked with emotions and emotional prayers, and we are to pray our feelings and emotions to the Lord. When, when you look in verse 1 and 2 in Psalms 3, David, here he brings two complaints that he prays to God, right? The first complaint is in verse 1. It says, oh Lord, I have so many enemies, so many people are against me. So he, he prays his emotions and he says, look Lord, I am in danger. My enemies are increasing in numbers. And then he brings even a deeper complaint in verse 2. And he says, so many are saying, God, you will never rescue me. Now, this is what they were saying about their king. They were not just attacking his body, but they were attacking his identity. They were attacking his calling. They, he was called by God to be the king. They were attacking his calling and his character. And David is telling God what's going on and how he is feeling about this whole thing. He is not bottling it up. He is not venting it to people around him that cannot help him with that anyways. He prays his thoughts, his feelings, his emotions honestly. We have the same teaching out of Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. It says the same thing, and it says, do not be anxious about anything. Yeah, right, right? That's what God says. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. 
So all our problems, you can bring them to the Lord, and the peace of God will guard our minds, our hearts. And then David shows us the second important thing to do about our people problems. Place your confidence in the Lord. When you pray, place your confidence in the, in the Lord. Look at verse 3a. It says, but you, O Lord. So what does David do? He presents and brings all his complaints and problems to the Lord. And he says, God, my, my, my enemies are growing in numbers. Uh, they say you don't care about me. They say you will not rescue me, but you, O oh Lord. So when you bring your complaints and, and your struggles and your problems to the Lord, you need to pray, but you need to come to the point where you then make it a turn in your prayer, where you now put you and place your confidence in him, and that's where you say, but you, O oh Lord. Here he, he confesses his faith. He places his confidence in the Lord. Things are looking really bad, but you, O oh Lord. When I think of confidence, that means that we have faith. We trust in God. It's true what he can do for us, and we know what he already has done for us. The same that David already had experienced. So many times, uh, we, I don't know, maybe I've, some of you may be guilty of it. Uh, you know, I know I have. You know, so many times we, we, we come to the Lord and we come before Him and we bring all our complaints and our problems to Him. And then we get back up from our knees from that prayer and we start complaining and we start being grumpy and we start picking up all the burdens of problems and we carry them on again. What happened? We, we just lay them at the feet of Christ. Why are we picking them back up? Why are we not trusting and having confidence in God that he's going to deal with it? I mean, I know I'm guilty of it, and I think that's just the lack of faith, or our faith is missing or misplaced. And David here, he, he brings him to the one that he knows that can take care of it, and that he has confidence in, that God will take care of him and that God can do whatever he wants to do with this situation and whenever he wants to do it. And he has confidence in, that, in this. And, and so he reminds us that we need to have confidence even when it doesn't look like the circumstances are changing. Have confidence in God. You trust in him. Next is also God is your protector. Look in verse 3a again. It says, but you, O Lord are the shield around me. Now, a shield is for protection. It protects us. David knows that if the Lord is our shield, our protector, it doesn't mean that, that the enemies will then stop shooting arrows at us. It doesn't even mean that you're not going to get a battle wound or two out of it. It's not what that means. It just means that you have confidence in God that nothing is going to happen to you that God will not allow that it can happen to you. You have that confidence. Listen, God did not promise to pull us away from our problems and battles. He promised to help us through the battle. You walk through the battle. You trust God. The battle may be short. The battle may be long but you stay close in relationship with God. Um, Psalms 34, 7, he says, For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. That's how we act in storms of life, in troubles of life. That's what we can learn how we should respond when we are in a battle and when the battle in our life is getting hot. David prayed confidently, because he knew his enemies were nothing compared to his God. Amen? That's what we need to be assured of. Our problems are nothing compared to the power and the presence of God. God is going to be your encourager. Verse 3b says, you are my glory, the one who holds my head high. Now, if you know the story in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 15, it talks about that 
that David was running to the Mount of Olives, weeping and barefooted. He's on a run. And it also says that he covered his head, and all the ones that were with him, they were covering their head, running towards this mountain. And this is just the way I imagine it. And today, they are running with their heads down, bowed down in humility, in, in hurt, in pain, in shame. Preferably nobody will recognize them or see them because I got an enemy behind me that wants to kill me. They're accusing me of being unfit. I don't belong. And, and somebody else is going to take the throne. But then... God is the lifter of the head. He's the one that picks up your shin, lifts up your head so you can look towards the Lord once again. You know, our trials and our difficulties will be less when we place them into the hands of God. Whatever is the biggest in your eye gets the most attention. Okay? Okay? So when you walk down in hurt and pain and shame or in difficulty, whether it was your fault or not, and your people problem that you have, but you have a relationship with God, he's going to pick up your head so you can look at the Lord and what has most attention in your eyes, what, what, you, what is biggest in your eyes will get the greatest attention. And all of a sudden, you will be able to focus on God more than on the problem. You will be able to focus on the one that can do something about your problems. You will focus on him more, that will get more attention than the problem itself because he can take care of our problems. Psalms 121 verse 1 and 2 says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. The Lord lifts up our heads when we are covering our heads, when we are looking down, and we can focus again on Him who is our the maker of heaven and earth. He's the one that gave you life. Life is a gift from God, and he, we can focus on Him. We will put our attention on Him more than on our problem because He can take care of it. So what is it that God could do for you today? If you're a child of God, he wants to do great things for you. Maybe he, you need a head lifting so you can see him, so you can turn your eyes towards him. And then next, God is your forgiver. And here is a long story I could share on, but, but I just don't have the time. But here in verse 4 it says, I call out to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy mountain. What's on the holy mountain? The tabernacle. The place of sacrifice. The place where sin was dealt with. Now, David wasn't confident because of what he thought he deserved or earned. He was confident because of who God is and in his promises and that he will deliver and will stay true to his promises. I think promises even like in Genesis chapter 15 where God made a promise to Abraham. It says in, in verse 1b, it says, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. And when you study Genesis chapter 15, it's the whole story of the promise of God to Abraham, how he's going to give him descendants more than the stars in the sky, and how he is going to bring a rescuer, a deliverer out of his family. And I believe David knew those promises, and David knew that God had also promised that through him, which he was a descendant of Abraham, that through him the, the Savior, the Rescuer would co come. And I believe he knew the promises of God, and so he trusted in who God is and what he has promised, and that is that God can be our Father because he is our Father, our Provider, and our Rescuer. I know that David didn't know so much of the story of God as we do today because we are living in the New Testament. But I do believe that there was a promise in Genesis chapter 15 to Abraham how he would bring a savior and a rescuer. He even made Abraham 
cut up animals to pieces, and at night in a fire torch, he would walk through those pieces as, a, uh, as the presence of the Lord. And, and the truth is, we probably have no idea what that means. But in the Bible time, you knew what that meant. It meant that somebody was to make a covenant. Somebody was making a, a, a vow and say, I will stick to what I commit today. I will stick to what I promise to you today. If I don't, then may it be with me like it has been with the animals. And they would make a, a vow or a covenant of that way. If we would do that today, people would stick to their word. Right? If you would get married and you make a promise and you would break it and you're going to be cut up to pieces, that we would have no divorce because if somebody would divorce, they would kill them. Right? That was the pro- covenant that God made with Abraham. I will deliver my promise. I will stick true to my promise. Even though you will be disobedient to your promise, even though, though because of you... I am going to get cut up to pieces, which on Calvary's hill, there was a darkness coming over. And God and his son Jesus, he was keeping his promise even when Abraham failed and didn't trust God. Do you know what should give you more confidence in the Lord than anything else? The cross. It's the cross. It's a reminder that God loves you It's a reminder when you study the Bible from the Old Testament to the New that God keeps his promises. It's a reminder that God is providing for you a way to be forgiven and to be cleansed so that you can be wholly forgiven through the blood of Christ and enter into the very presence of God in prayer. The Bible says the way we enter to the very presence of God is through the name of Jesus because he's the one that made that way for, for us that we could be forgiven and cleansed so we can go into the presence of God. So how do we pray about our people problems? We bring our complaints to the Lord. We place our confidence in the Lord. And then lastly, expect your comfort from the Lord. Expect a comfort David says in our pains and problems, we can anticipate our comfort from the Lord. It will involve rest for your body. Look at verse 5. He says, I lay down in sleep, yet I woke up in safety, for the Lord was watching over me. Now David could rest, not because circumstances had changed, but because God gave him that rest. He made him that he could fall asleep. And that he could rest in the middle of a storm, in the middle of problems. And David knew when he woke up that God was the one that was protecting him. God was the one that gave him this peace. You know, many times when you are in difficulties and storms of life, if you can't sleep or can't sleep, it depends a little bit how much you trust God and how much confidence you have in him that he hears you and he will deliver you. Psalms 127, 2 says, God grants sleep to those he loves. Despite of all our problems, difficulties, God provides rest. It's comfort. Now, what else? It will also involve love for your emotions. Look at verse 6. I am not afraid of 10,000 enemies who surround me on every side. Wow. That's confidence in God, right? The people in their eyes, there's no way God will ever rescue him. He is fully confident that God will. Now, you know what the Bible teaches us? What's the opposite of fear? The opposite of fear is love. And 1 John 4, 18 says, perfect love drives out all fear. When fear and anxiety control us, it's because we have forgotten how much we are loved. And when love fills us, fear flees us. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, or is it verse 17? Don't hold me against it, but somewhere is in there. The Bible says that the Lord has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love. And so the opposite of fear is love. Let's not forget how much we have been loved by God. So when we bring our complaints before the Lord, we can confidently pray because we are reminded 
how He loves us. And when we are faithful and do that, He will fill us with His love. He will remind us over and over that He will keep His promises. He will remind us what He has done for us. And He will will remind us that we are truly sons and daughters of the living God. And when you are reminded of it through the Holy Spirit, through your prayer, and you are confident in God and your prayers, He will remind you that you are one of His children. David says in in our problems and pains, we should expect a comfort from the Lord, which will also involve victory in the future. Look at verse 7 and 8. He says, Arise, O Lord, rescue me, my God. Slap all my enemies in the face. Shatter the teeth of the wicked. Victory comes from you, O Lord. May you bless your people. Victory belongs to the Lord. During the time you're in, it may look impossible. But the end of it, victory will be present. In in verse 2, we saw that his enemy said, God will never rescue him from this. Man doesn't have the last word. God has the last word. Man does not have the victory. God has the victory. Even when it looks impossible, God makes it possible. Victory belongs to the Lord. If you are a child of God, you're walking with the Lord, you have a relationship with Him, you know Him, and victory belongs to the Lord, that means that victory belongs to you. Victory will come. Then he says in the last part, in verse 8, may you bless your people. That wasn't just a testimony for David only, but for all the children of God that God will bless his people. Let us do what David did so that we can be victorious. Would you bring your complaints to the Lord instead of to others? Would you bring your people problems to the Lord and expect victory and expect comfort? Let me me just say it this way in, in closing. When I think of people problems. And I know that nobody raised a hand earlier that you had people problems. But let me just say it this way. Sometimes your people problem is the person sitting right next to you. Sometimes it may be the person, your parents or your children or your friends or the work you work at or the church leadership. Somewhere you have people problems in life. We will have them. Can you bring that to the Lord? And be confident that he will lead and guide. And that he will bring victory towards the end. You know, I I have sometimes said this to my wife. You know, I I don't know if you realize it or not, but I sometimes have people problems too. That's surprising, right? But I do. I, I sometimes get hate texts, hate emails. They say things to me that are absolutely not true. Slander me. Um, thank God none of you do that, at least not as far as I'm aware of. Uh, They do whatever they can. They want to hurt me. They want to slander me. They want me to be destroyed by God's calling in my life. And the Bible says when you will become a pastor, you're going to have that. So I shouldn't be surprised, right? Sometimes people say, but this is what people say about you. And I've often said to my wife, you know what? If it is not true, then I'm not going to be all that concerned about it. If there is a concern, I'm just going to bring it to God. Let him deal with it. There's going to be victory at the end. I mean, if it gets very messy and it has to be dealt with, then yeah, you have to deal with it. But oftentimes I tell my wife, if they tell stuff about me and if it's not true, why should I be so concerned about it? Because it's not true. And God is going to handle it. He's going to bring victory. I've heard people many times, they get so upset and so mad about their people problems because somebody has said something about them and it's not true. You can let it go. Just give it to God. At the end of it, victory will be yours. Now, if somebody says something, I have always told her my responsibility is, okay, is it true? If it is true, then I have a responsibility. And my responsibility is to 
accept my wrong or sin and respond with humility and apologize for it. And also, if it involved other people, then do my part to reconcile. That is my responsibility and call that everyone's supposed to do. The biggest weakness in humanity, and that is this. If somebody does wrong, whether purposely or not purposely, like we do wrong without even realizing it sometimes, and we're innocent of the known of it, but it's still that we did it for something wrong. My experience has been, and that's a sad note, if you go and tell somebody that was wrong, and you do that because the Bible says you who are spiritually filled, you need to go and correct somebody. You need to help them. 90 to 95% of the time, the very first response you will get is an attack back. They will accuse you of blaming something that you may have done in your life, and it will go in circles, and it will go nowhere. And it causes a big uproar and damage and hurt and pain and memories that you can't forget for a long time. But if you do it, we need to learn in that, folks. If that happens to us, realize it will. We are human beings. If it's true, don't at attack the messenger. Just say, you know what, that is true. That was wrong. I'm sorry. Forgive me. Is there somebody else involved? Then I need to go and deal with that as well. Bring your complaints to the Lord. Have confidence in Him that He will answer. If you're a child of God, then you are His child. And know at the end of it, there will be victory if we are going to have a close relationship with Him and stay true to God. If you have any prayer needs, our prayer team will be in a prayer room after the service. They would love to pray for you. You can just go in there and they'll pray for you. Please join me in a prayer. Would you please stand for a prayer? Father God, we are so thankful that you are on a throne. We are so thankful that we can see the life of David and how he had a relationship with you, God. We can also see that he had a lot of failures, a lot of mess-ups, a lot of hang-ups. We also can see in our message today that he had struggles in his own family. He had people problems. They want to kill him. But we see how he trusted you, God. We see how he brought his complaints and hurts and, and, and anxiety and depressions to you. And you were his healer. You were his, uh, the one that would revive him. You were the one that would give, bring victory at the end. And Father God, I just pray for the group of people or everybody listening, that if there's people here today that have a problem or struggling, I pray that they will bring that complaint to you today. And I pray that you will restore them, that you will heal them, whatever the complaint that may be, whatever hurt they go through. And I pray that if we are guilty, that we would do the right things, that you can bless us, that you can have your favor over us. Lord God, as we confidently pray our emotions and feelings and problems to you, help us, empower us through your power, through your presence of your Holy Spirit, to have fully confidence in you, knowing that nothing is going to happen that you will not allow to happen to us. And whatever it will be, it will glorify you and it will serve for our good. Even though it may not look good, even may, though it not feel good, even may it, we don't even see it, how it could be good. Help us to have confidence in you. And I pray if anybody has needs here today that they will call out to you or will call to a brother or sister and say, hey, how can I deal with this? What can I do with this? Could you pray for me? Help us to care for one another. Help us to love one another the way you love us. Would you bless and protect us? In Jesus' name, amen.